Hello and welcome to another episode of 8-Bit Keys. So I know the title says Casio CA100. Now what I have here says realistic concert made on it. So for those who don't know, uh, this was sold in Radio Shack back in probably the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, during that time, Radio Shack would not allow any product on their store shelves that didn't have one of their in-store brand names on it. So you would never find anything marked Casio or Sony or Panasonic or anything like that. Now, uh, Realistic was the brand name they chose for uh, many of their uh, musical or audio type uh, devices. So uh, anyway, uh, the only thing that I know that's different between this and the Casio is the demo tune. So the uh, Casio version has a Rick Astley demo tune on it, and this one has some other thing. Uh, but um, I picked this up in an estate sale for about five bucks um, just recently. and. There's actually nothing wrong with it. There's nothing for me to repair. Uh, there's nothing that needs to be restored on it. It's in perfect condition. Um, but before I get around to reviewing it, there is something, uh, one modification I want to make. Um, it has no line output jack. It's uh, All it's got is a, um, a regular power port and a headphone jack. Now, theoretically, yes, I can sample sound from the headphone jack, but it's annoying. Um, I like to be able to plug these keyboards directly into, say, a laptop or a computer, and I want to be able to hear what I'm recording. And if you use the headphone jack, then the speaker gets turned off. And so then I have to play in silence, or I have to find, um, you know, I could use, you know, something like this and plug in with a Y splitter, or, you know, there's a, a hundred other ways you can go about solving that problem. Uh, but I don't have really a recording studio. You know, I just like to keep this real simple. And I just like to be able to hear what I'm playing. Um, and, and it just makes it so much easier for me if I have a line output jack. So a lot of people have asked in previous episodes, how do I install these line output jacks? Uh, for example, I, I installed one on this guy because it had no headphone jack or anything. And, you know, I didn't really go into a lot of detail about how you find the line level signal. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to show you how to find it and how to do it. And, uh, and then I'm going to demonstrate the keyboard for you. So here's how I typically go about finding a line signal on these older keyboards. The board will have a synthesizer chip that produces a line level signal, which is then fed into an amplifier of some sort, and then that powers the internal speaker. Now some synthesizer chips output a digital signal, and so they'll have a separate chip, which is a digital to analog converter of some sort, and there should be a line level signal somewhere between the DAC and the amplifier. And so you can tap off these at either side to get the signal. Okay, so obviously I'll need to disassemble the keyboard. And this one is really weird because it has quite a bit of hollow space on the top and the bottom with a big long metal piece in the center. Anyway, I'll just start unscrewing things and see what I find. Okay, so removing this metal piece only really revealed the speaker and the key mechanism, so I'll have to keep unscrewing to find the main board. However, I did find a date stamp that shows this was made sometime between March and May of 1990. Okay, so apparently after enough screws are removed, this top piece comes off. Now I've found the board, and it appears this entire keyboard is controlled by a single chip. And over here is the amplifier chip attached to a heatsink. So I know the amplifier is an LA4597, so I'll try to find a data sheet on it, and I did. But the data sheet is a bit confusing for most, so I've created an illustration for the amplifier chip. This thing has two inputs, presumably so it could be a stereo amplifier, uh, two outputs, and a ground, and it runs on 9 volts DC. The next thing I need to do is get a look at the other side of this board. The trouble is I can't power on the keyboard with the board unscrewed because of the way the power switch works, so I'll just take a good picture of it and then screw it back down. Now that I have that, I just want to confirm a few things about this chip. So I'll stick the negative probe of my multimeter on this battery spring. That should be chassis ground. Now, back to my photo. This should be pin number one, since I'm looking at it from the underside. Uh, this is pin number eight, which should have nine volts DC on it. Once I put this board back down, I should be able to find that connected to any of these things. So I'll check here, and sure enough, there is nine volts. It's fluctuating some because I have the demo tune running. So I want to stay away from that pin when poking around with my line signal. Next, I will put my meter in continuity test mode so I can poke around and figure out what's connected to what. Okay, so I've confirmed that the schematic matches the chip here. But I was confused about some things, and I had to check with a friend of mine who's an electrical engineer to find the answer. 
Okay, so most other cheap keyboards I've done work like this. They have the audio signal go to the amp, and then it gets boosted and connects to the positive terminal of the speaker. The negative terminal just goes to ground. Simple, huh? Well, on this keyboard, the audio goes to the two separate amplifier inputs, and both are amplified. Uh, one goes to the positive terminal, and the other one gets inverted and goes to the negative terminal. That way, the voltage difference between the positive and negative on the speaker is even greater, making it louder. So, time to do some poking and prodding. I'm going to unsolder the speaker for the moment so I can clearly hear what audio I'm dealing with. And then I'll connect this RCA cable up to my boombox and use some alligator clips on the other end. I'll attach a ground to the battery ground again, and then I'll stick a little capacitor on the end of my positive lead, uh, as this is protection against transferring any voltage to my boombox. I'll set the demo tune running so I have something to hear, and here's what I found. Tapping off either of these inputs, uh, like I originally planned, ended up being too weak. I can hear the sound, but it's very faint. Tapping off of either of these two output lines actually produces a nearly perfect line level signal. However, once I reconnected the speaker, it ended up pulling the signal down some, so these are just a bit too quiet now. So just for comparison, if I use this particular audio capture device, it has no gain control at all. Not in software, not in hardware. So, if I use it to capture from just one leg of the speaker with ground, it sounds like this. And if I capture from both legs of the speaker, it sounds like this. If you look at the visual representation, uh, this section here is captured from one leg, and this is captured from both, so this is really about the perfect signal. So all that's left to do is drill a hole. I picked this location, since there appeared to be room next to the other existing ports on the keyboard, and then I just soldered the capacitor and a couple of wires to the speaker connections. So the irony is, in most cases I will say not to capture from the speaker and instead get the signal from the board. But in the case of this particular keyboard, I honestly think it's probably the best place to get it from. I'm not really entirely sure why it worked out that way. So now let's talk about the keyboard itself. So it says pulse code modulation right here on the front, but I'm going to tell you right now, I don't believe that it's really pulse code modulation. I mean, I think the drums are pulse code modulation, but I think everything else is not. It may be possible that some of the instruments are using PCM samples, but if they are, the sample rate is so low and it sounds so bad, it's, it's really hard for me to say that it is PCM. So let me give you a tour of some of the sounds on this thing. It does claim to have 100 sounds, which is not entirely accurate as some of these, especially these here, are just taking other sounds and splitting the keyboard. Still, even with 90 sounds, there's too many to demonstrate here, so I'll give you a sampling of some that I like. Now, I find it odd that any tone bank keyboard starts off on brass. I mean, why would anyone want that as a default instrument? Piano would make so much more sense. So, I'm going to do a polyphony test real quick by holding down the high note. And it looks like I can play three other notes before it cuts off. So that's four voice polyphony. However, let me try another instrument like this flute. Okay, so on simpler instruments, it looks like there's an eight voice polyphony. Okay, so here's the piano. Doesn't sound all that great as expected. The most annoying part is there's no sustain option of any sort, so I find myself wanting to hold the keys down longer. I actually think I like the electric piano sound better, although they moved it up an entire octave. Okay, so this is the vibraphone. It doesn't really have any sustain to it. I keep looking for a better bell type instrument, but just not finding one.
This is called sample percussion. I'm not sure what it is supposed to be. This is rock drum, which is a form of manual drums, but the layout didn't really make any sense at first. Then I realized they're essentially giving you only four sounds, and each one is on its own octave. Okay, so this is synth read, a nice square wave tone. This is one of my favorite. Synth piano is probably my favorite piano type instrument on here. Also, the bass instruments are interesting because they move them up higher on the keyboard and then on the lower octaves they give you drums. Ok, let's try some sound effects. This is called Airplane, and if you hold it down long enough the sound starts to change pitch. If it weren't for that, it would be one of the coolest instruments on this thing because if I avoid holding it down, I can create some pretty cool sounds. Ok, so now I'm going to do a little multi-track tune for you. Now this is the same tune that I did a while back on the Casio HT700. Now many people have asked me to do the same song on more than one keyboard so that they could better tell the difference between how the two keyboards sound. So that's what I've done, so have a listen. And so I think if you go back and you listen to the version I did on the HT700, you'll hear a remarkable difference. The HT700 uh, sounding better, of course, because it was closer to the professional side of things. So where do I place this on my toy meter? Well, I'm going to put it right at the entry level for the amateur keyboards. I am taking into account that this was made in 1990. And so because of that, I really expected more out of it compared to similar keyboards from the same time period. So what do I think of this keyboard overall? Well, to be honest, I was a little bit disappointed with it because, I mean, hey, it's got a tone bake of 100 sounds, so I thought, surely I'll like at least 40 or 50 of those sounds, but in reality, I only, uh, only ended up liking about maybe 10 of the sounds on this keyboard, which means that it's really no better off than using a, you know, a Casio like one of these that has less than 20 sounds to begin with. That being said, people often ask me for advice on picking a retro keyboard, and I'm actually going to be doing an episode on that eventually, but I think it's safe to say that this keyboard will not be making it on like the top 10 list. <laughs> I am looking forward um, to reviewing two keyboards that I received as donations last month. Um, one of them is this Casio MT68, which uh, is pretty cool, and I look forward to showing you this. The second one... is this Yamaha PSR6, and uh, it's also a tone bank keyboard. I haven't even fired this thing up yet, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited about how it's going to sound. So anyway, I look forward to bringing you the episodes on this, so stick around for that, and um, well, thanks for watching.